welcome to the forum. Uh, uh, we are now live and we are being recorded as well. So I am Atiya Mahmood. I am your moderator for today's discussion. I welcome you all to the third global conversation organized by Athena 40, a platform of the Global Thinkers Forum that promotes female leadership by connecting women to mentoring, knowledge, networks, and opportunities to meet and share experiences. This is an international event, uh, the only one of its kind, with panel discussions taking place in parallel across Karachi, Oregon, and Irving, USA, London, Zagreb, Lagos, Nairobi, Amman, and Beirut. We are very excited to be part of this and host our panel in Karachi, with panelists joining us from Islamabad and Lahore as well. We are meeting at a time in history where the whole world is reeling from the effects of COVID-19. It is commonly understood that the impact of COVID will be especially severe on women for a number of reasons, economic, social, professional, psychological, and emotional. Conversations around promoting more women into decision-making role are even more timely and important than they were a year ago. Women leadership in times of crisis will be the focus of the third global conversation, which also marks the International Women's Day. Can I request you all to introduce yourselves, who you are, what you do, and give a statement or story that has defined who you are today. Make it brief, punchy, and powerful. <laughs> uh, I would have asked Dr. Sanya to start, but since she's not joined us yet, so I'll ask Parat for a brief introduction of yourself. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ambassador Atia, for giving us the opportunity to be at the forum. Uh, my name is Farah Asif. I'm Islamabad-based, um, a founder president of Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies. For the past 14 years, I've been publishing a magazine called The Diplomatic Insight. It's, called, it's a public diplomacy thematic objective uh, magazine working with the diplomatic missions, primarily projecting Pakistan's softer image to the global community. Um, my statement of the story or what who I am right now is a story of resilience, a story of leadership, a story of doing impossible things in my life. Um, and primarily the person who has remained as my beacon of hope and support is my mother and now late father, uh, brother, and of course my husband right now. Um, and of course, um, this all became an impossible because somebody said, you can't do it. So I did it twice, rather 14 years continuously doing and, uh, and showing the world that this, uh, nothing is poss impossible. Only you have to do is continue your, continue your struggle, believe in yourself. And this is what I am today. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for giving me the opportunity to be at the forum right now. Thank you. And Maria? Can I ask Maria to give her statement? Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Ambassador Atia. It's an honor. Um, so uh, I'm Maria Omar. I'm the president and founder of a social enterprise called the Women's Digital League that works for the economic empowerment of women. We've been doing this since 2012. Um, a defining moment in my life would be when I was fired from a school job, school teaching job, uh, a school that was owned by a woman because I was expecting my second child and they believed that I couldn't work anymore because I'll be too busy tending after my, uh, looking after my child. Uh, and that made, made me realize how few an opportunities women actually have in the workforce and the ones that they do have, how many hurdles they face even in that, but something as simple as, you know, as normal as, you know, getting married or having children. So that's where Women's Digital League started from. And it's been a long, a very, very, gratifying journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I move on to Ayla for her story? Hello, um, I'm Ayla Raza. Um, I have to say, uh, when I made my personal statement, initially, I 
spoke to my daughter about it and she said throw it out it's terrible <laughs> but because i'm myself i'm a bit of a private person and uh, ironically in uh, life my life experiences sort of throw me in uh, uh, public social spheres all the time and i'm here just because of that i'm uh, heading the all pakistan music conference karachi which is a society uh, that promotes and uh, that works for the preservation promotion and development of uh, uh, traditional arts and uh, traditional performing arts music and dance um, uh, we've been at it for the past 14 uh, for, for the past 18 years now and uh, Uh, that's what i do uh, in in my former life i was an architect um uh, i'm now a khayal practitioner which is a classical music uh, genre um have been for the past 20 25 years it's a wonderful wonderful journey um other than that i'm uh, uh, i'm co-head of a lovely supportive family um and that's it really Thank you, lovely Ayla. Thank you so much. So <clears throat> that's uh, is Abdiya there. Abdiya, can I ask you to give your story? Yeah, sure. My name is Abdiya Shaheen, and thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, I'm from Lahore, Pakistan, and I'm working as a program manager at the Plex Malagin Foundation. an organization that is led by the founder president wasrat mispa and works for the rehabilitation of the acid burnt victims so um not only this i also work for different issues like for the issues of uh, rights of uh, transgenders uh, rights uh, for uh, the physically challenged people who are not Uh, given that equal opportunity to get education to be in the part of employment and what makes me today is uh, i'm grown up my own self my father and my mother died when i was 11 years old but alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i'm blessed to have a wonderful brother who supported me and alhamdulillah of course a very supportive husband uh, so uh, the different hurdles and glass ceiling made me what i am today alhamdulillah thank you that's that's really an amazing story uh, one that uh, makes you feel uh, fortunate and uh, of course inspires you uh, well done abdia uh, now since uh, yeah dr sania is there and uh, may i request dr sania yes um, uh, assalam alaikum and good evening uh, all the wonderful colleagues that i can see on the screen thank you ambassador atia for inviting me to be part of this uh, amazing panel it's uh, both a pleasure and a privilege uh, by way of introduction i think you have been very kind in uh, outlining uh, a few things about myself i currently serve as cabinet mem uh, cabinet member with a portfolio of social protection i'm special assistant to the prime minister of pakistan and last week i was elected as member of the upper house by training i am a physician uh and a very large part of my life i've spent building civil society uh, institutions working at the grassroots level with very underprivileged communities i've served as a physician um as a as a cardiologist in a public sector mm -hmm. hospital uh and i have also uh been working with multilateral organizations uh over the last 20 years in different capacities serving on commissions and committees and boards uh in 2017 i was uh i ran as uh, for the position of director general of the world health organization i was pakistan's official nominee and i was in the final shortlist of 3 and now in hindsight i think i was blessed that i was not elected to that position or else i would be managing a very complex uh, global uh, catastrophe today um uh, 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 ambassador atia you said that i should uh, talk about a personal story um and i think there are inflection points in one's lives and um uh, for me a very key inflection point was when i was working as a as a, a tertiary care a uh, cardiologist in a, 
uh, in, in a hospital, in a public sector hospital in Pakistan. So I had spent about 10 years training. I was a trained cardiologist. And you know that cardiologists earn a lot. They make very, they're very affluent. They make a very good living. And I recall working in a cath lab. And one day there was a hospital circular which said that you cannot open disposables for patients who can't pay. You can only open hospital disposables if a patient is able to pay. If a, if, if a, if a poor person comes and they're unable to pay, we don't have disposables for them. We can, you, can re, you can reuse those disposables. Uh, and I recall it standing in that cath lab, which is like an operation theater. Uh, and I recall standing there and told myself, I said, that's not how I want to spend my life, treating the rich in a very different way. And those who need the help the most are the ones that I'm just shunning, pushing away, treating in a very different way. And in those days, I was a cardiologist. I did not know anything about public policy. I did not know anything about development or grassroots work. Uh, but I made a fundamental decision today that that is not how I'm going to lead my professional life. And I decided to embark on a very long journey. And that journey has taken me from hospitals to boardrooms, from grassroots to multilateral tables, to chairing multilateral uh, commissions from patients' bedsides to board tables. Um, and, and I found during the course of that journey that uh, the, the process of change starts with truth and integrity as it's starting. So I'm, I'm really very blessed and privileged to, to have the responsibility, uh, to have the responsibility of making some change in the lives of very disadvantaged uh, people. And uh, during COVID, we saw that firsthand, but I don't want to dominate the discussion. So I'll hand it back to you and uh, look forward to coming back again uh, to continue uh, whenever there's an opportunity. Thank you, Akhil. Thank you so much. Uh Fantastic. Uh, you're so right. One has to, at points in time of one's life, consider what is to be done and what is your aim and purpose in life. And I think you found it uh, by working for this program, which is helping so many underprivileged people. <clears throat> so now we have about um, 45 minutes uh, to discuss the questions that we have shared. And uh, I would ask uh, Dr. Sanya, because that's the order that I had put the questions in, <laughs> that uh, the first question is to you, which is that we have seen some fine examples of collaborative, compassionate, and efficient leadership over the past year. An analysis of 194 countries found that women-led nations have a better handle on the coronavirus pandemic. Not only were infection rates generally lower, fatality rates were also noticeably low. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that uh, there's a little bit of echo on your end. I see. I think it's gone now. It's okay. gone now, thank you. So I think there's a lot of evidence which now tells us that organizations need to invest in, in a space that is diverse from a, gender, from a gender perspective, that diversity is very crucial in the workplace. Because women constitute 50% of the, of the world's population. And if an organization, if a government, if an institution, if an entity, if a business, uh, gains from the skills, the talents, the business acumen, the leadership potential of women, and is able to exploit a synergy with the competencies of men, it performs much better. Because women have a very different way of dealing with, in, in, of operating in a workspace. They are, have a very different way of dealing with building partnerships, and forging collaboration. They have a very different approach to, uh, to dealing with evidence, with, in, with information, with, um, with management of human resource. They have a very different approach to risk-taking, to design, to, to so many other uh, aspects uh, of decision-making in the work 
place. And all the body of evidence tells us that when the workspace is diverse, when women have, when the, in organizations with a high percentage of women in there at the leadership level, the outcomes of the organization and, uh, uh, and the word organization I'm using metaphorically for, for any institutional arrangement, that the organization outcome is a lot better in terms of uh, outcomes of interest, in terms of uh, innovation, in terms of return on investment. Uh, so I'm not surprised that um, the analysis of 194 countries has shown that wherever women have led, the outcomes have been a lot better in terms of um, in, in, in terms of whatever you mentioned, fatality rates and infection rates in, in, the, in the COVID context. But I just want to stress on this point that it is not in the COVID context alone. It, for a very long time, meta-analyses and individual studies have consistently shown us that the more diverse the workspace, the better the outcomes. The more uh, the percentage of women in leadership positions uh, the, the better the, uh, does the outcome, the organization score on, on, on a number of different uh, outcomes. So the results of this 194 country studies uh, comes as no, by, by no means comes as a surprise to me. Thank you. Uh, I think we cannot but uh, agree to the fact that, uh, as you have stated, uh, diversity is extremely important for any organization and to, uh, to have inclusion for 50% uh, population of any country organization or uh, wherever they are, they should be part of that uh, decision-making and leadership processes to be able to perform. And the results then that come out are what we have seen in this one, uh, the, uh, the, what they talk about of the results from different countries where women have led the situation and resulted in, in this particular reference COVID. But as you said, of course, it is not restricted to this particular last year, but it is a general principle that applies all the time. So oh, kindly, can you also uh, make out uh, for us, Dr. Sanya, what were the most, uh, the biggest challenges and lessons learned so far from your perspective? during this pandemic? Well, during the pandemic, um, I mean, I can speak from my vantage point from, uh, from what I had responsibility for. So when, co when COVID struck, as you know, Pakistan in Pakistan, uh, two thirds of the population either subsists on daily wages or they are self-employed or they have peace rate employment. And when the lockdowns came into effect, life with this, uh, for these breadwinners uh, practically stalled. Uh, according to estimate, they, they were about 16 million breadwinners uh, and a very large percentage of the Pakistani population dependent on them, life for them came to a grinding halt. So I was responsible in the cabinet for getting cash out, on, uh, to, uh, out into their hands, uh, subsistence cash, uh, and the government decided to give uh, rupees 12,000, which is the equivalent of $75, uh, to 15 million households, which is uh, more than two thirds of the households of, uh, of the country. So, uh, so I view the challenges of the pandemic from, uh, from social protection, from the emergency social protection vantage point. Uh, and within that context, uh, the challenge was to set up the institutional arrangement, to get cash into their hands, uh, to make sure that it's done in the most transparent, uh, apolitical, neutral, uh, and uh, an effective manner. Uh, and of course, we were uh, we were blessed because over the uh, a year prior to uh, to COVID, we had agreed on SAS. It, SAS was formally announced as a social protection program. And we had spent a year making the digital backbone uh, for its payment system, for its data analytics mechanism, uh, and, and a whole host of other uh, digital infrastructure that we had to create. And we had to piece them together for this program. And of course, the challenge was that things needed to happen with great speed. So that was, that was a big challenge. Uh, the other challenge, of course, was the awareness challenge, uh, and, and 
because people are, digital literacy is very low, um, financial literacy is very low, uh, literacy on its own is very low, and to roll out a program of that nature where uh, digital know-how, some level of digital know-how had to come into play was, uh, was, was, was quite a formidable challenge. But more, uh, and of course, as we rolled out the program, uh, there, there were layers and layers of issues that we encountered, but we continue to communicate with people that here is what we're doing, uh, here is what we're trying to aspire, this is the methodology. We are going to continue to run into problems, but this is our strategy to mitigate uh, those problems. And, and I think overall, it was a program very well done. Uh, but in the heat of the moment, uh, it, it was, uh, it, it seemed an impossible task. And I'm, I'm, I, I feel very privileged that and humbled that me and my colleagues were able to, to, to turn this around. But in terms of the overall challenge, of course, COVID was a big, big blow to economies. It was, it was a big blow to health systems. Uh, the biggest challenge was the capacity of the health systems. It, it, COVID really exposed the weaknesses of health systems all over the world, and especially in countries like ours. It exposed the weaknesses in the health information systems and disease surveillance systems. It exposed the, the lack of, uh, uh, of uh, bringing into the net of the private sector, which uh, which people have been talking about for decades, that the private health sector in Pakistan is not part of the formal net. The laboratories are not regulated. We don't know where the private health providers are. We have no mechanism of mapping them. So when COVID struck, all these systemic weaknesses of the health system were, were exposed uh, in country by country by country. Uh, but as they say, there is a silver lining to every cloud. Uh, so I think on the one hand, COVID has, uh, has fueled a lot of interest in the need to strengthen health systems, the need to strengthen health information systems, disease information systems, the whole uh, rubric of health security is, is receiving a lot of uh, positive attention. Uh, and, from, uh, and from my side of the table, which is the social protection side, I think the way we executed SAS emergency cash uh, really changed the way the government works because it was a highly ambitious program run end to end digitally in, in, a, in a totally different way from what was the practice in the past. Uh, we we just request, received requests through SMS, ran the profiles of individuals through data analytics and pushed out the payments through a biometrically enabled digital payment system. It was a highly ambitious program, totally digitally run. And it made the government, I think it has made the government more agile, more experimental, more ambitious. And it has really fast tracked the adoption of digital ways of working. Perhaps under ordinary circumstances, it would have taken 10 years to get to that stage. Uh, but it really forced us to do those things. And now those, those, practices, uh, those practices and that risk-taking behavior has become part of our DNA. So uh, yes, there were challenges, but, but, um, but I think that we will come out of this uh, crisis stronger and, which, and with much stronger systems, particularly as far as health and social protection is concerned. Thank you, Dr. Sanya. You're so right uh, in saying that all the time, this kind of a tragedy situation which we encountered, the whole world encountered, brought in some innovations also, as you have said, in your SAS program with reference to Pakistan. And that was the silver lining. So obviously, leadership, uh, your leadership, obviously combined with the opportunity that we got. and. Uh, we were able to initiate and roll out this program, which I'm sure is helping a lot of women. Uh, and uh, we, we hear good news about the program and we wish you success uh, for the future as well. So um, Farhat, tell me, women's representation in Pakistan in politics is very low. Uh, how can we change that? Do you think that the pandemic can also be an opportunity to reset our world and provide momentum to push for more women in decision-making 
roles. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Atya. This is such an uh, important question and something that I always, uh, you know, always proponent. I mean, I always talk about this, that how important it is for women to be at the leadership positions, at the political positions also, uh, leading political parties, as we have seen many who are there. Um, uh, as uh, Dr. Sanya, seeing you also are sitting at an important position, and especially when you look at social cohesion, social challenges, um, I think that no other than uh, a woman can handle such a big challenge also, understand that entire challenge, and a woman can also understand how a woman at the grassroots level can understand, you know, face the entire challenge and how can she can resolve and what are the needs of her, um, especially looking at as a caregiver. Um, when you talk about COVID-19, I always, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, what you say, positive is some, somebody who is always look at as a silver lining. I think that COVID-19 has brought us a lot of women at the community level, seeing them uh, working at the grassroots, combining their energies, leaderships, um, and coming out stronger, helping the communities to rebuild, uh, helping them not only themselves as households, but also build out the communities. We have seen a lot of examples of women at the community service. And you, as you know, this community service can lead, lead those women to up to the leadership position. And political parties, um, they break, they grow big through this community service. And having these kind of women, identifying them at this important position time when COVID-19 has given out a lot of women um, and given them opportunity and of course showing them leadership coming out uh, in the in in the community service these political parties need to invest and invite these women to 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 their tables discuss with them connect with them so i think that covid 19 has given us a lot of opportunities for these women to be identified and later given them opportunity to raise at the leadership position i think that it's an opportunity time for everybody we have seen not only at the community level we have seen the uh, you know women who have been leading uh, the countries uh, were more uh, able to you know to, uh, solve the issue of COVID-19 rather than the other countries, I must say. So these are a few of the opportunity times that we must capitalize on. Thank you so much. You're so right that elitism in politics has to go and more power and uh, leadership roles should be given to workers at grassroots levels. That is what will bring about the change uh, in the lives of ordinary people of the country. Ayla, why is empathy so important, especially during times of crisis? The word being empathy and as again, sympathy, empathy meaning you, um, you're actually able to put yourself in another's shoes and uh, because crises, I guess, crises that's like this one, um, their impact is widespread um, and our societies now, we, we realize their complexities, we're sensitive to each, um, each other's um, um, uh, 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 aspirations and needs and uh, which, which might uh, differ from, from uh, in terms of gender, in terms of uh, uh, economic uh, strata, in terms of ethnic, uh, 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 our ethnic uh, uh, sub-communities and so on. Uh, so it's, it's extremely important that in, in, terms, in times of crises, um, as against uh, times in which uh, uh, leaders look to uh, majority and uh, to, uh, to, uh, to um, uh, solutions that would impact majorities. And you know, this, this, these are times in which uh, nobody should be left behind. And you have to cater to the, to the various different needs of different uh, sub-communities. So uh, that's why I think uh, amongst, uh, uh, that's why you see um, how and the uh, the reactions to how how New Zealand and how um, uh, Germany under uh, Angela Merkel 
that's how they uh, they did well because uh, they were the, the leaders were effectively able to uh, put themselves in the other's shoes and uh, find solutions to everyone's um, issues. Uh, so I, I think that's why um, it's very important. Empathy is a is a very very important. Um, uh, yeah, this, uh, of uh, crisis times. Yes, um, you so right. Um, because it is at time of crisis that your true nature comes out. It can come out in a negative way. It can come out in a positive way. But we saw last year that it was more in a positive manner that people went out to help uh, to help people to help everybody regardless of gender and ethnicity, as you say. Ethnicity, right. so that is extremely. Sorry, it has a kind of sympathy has a kind of a, a, a more of a patronizing uh, uh, side to it. But empathy, on the other hand, is when you actually feel the uh, the the uh, the need and the uh, the desire, the aspirations of the other. So yes, you, that's a very you, very. Important. That's absolutely right. You empathize. You empathize with their pain, with their suffering, with whatever uh, anybody is going through at certain period in time of their lives and in lives of a nation, nation's life, like in this particular case where everybody was affected. So empathy had to be shown by each and every one of us as an important component of our own individual personalities and a self-satisfaction to our own self that we can do something for the other. I think that that is extremely important and it came out uh, in a good way. And we hope that we can build up on that uh, empathy that uh, we showed uh, during this time. <laughs> so Abhya, uh, what are the assumptions and biases that you have experienced as a female leader in your particular field? Uh, first challenge, our first assumption that as a female I have uh, faced is, you are a female, you cannot work in an NGO sector. That is not a right place for you. And the second one is gender pay gap. Uh, we, we live in a society, uh, I think males are given more better pay than females. And ultimately, females invest more time than men. So this is one of the things I have faced. And I think um, there is some glass ceiling effect in all uh, these assumptions that we cannot go through it. We realize those when we are practically into the thing. So the major issue and the major assumption uh, was that you are a female, you cannot work in an NGO sector, uh, and uh, you cannot uh, you can you cannot be that competitive to the uh, male members, and uh, you do not have that skill level which is suitable, and uh, you do not have that skill level which meets this criteria. So these were some of the challenges and assumptions that. Uh, Females, not only not only me, but different females and uh, males also might uh, face this. But it's very it's it's very you can say difficult for females to uh, to to be in a position to be in on that level where people can accept them at the workplaces. So these are some of the challenges uh, which, as a female, I have faced during my career, my time. You have, um, from what you told us in your introduction, you have achieved a lot, uh, having uh, fallen back uh, early in your life, uh, having lost your parents, uh, and then you were, and you and your brother were supporting each other. And then you come yeah. to this sector, which is again, supporting a lot of women who have uh, who, who fall back for various reasons in their lives and in their professions even. So these kind of challenges uh, you have faced and you, you mentioned NGO sector as a particular sector where uh, you were told that women or girls cannot work. But I, I would like you to say a little bit more on that. 
because the, yeah, sure. yeah uh, thanks yeah uh, in ngo sector there is more of the field work that uh, someone has to do uh, so uh, irrespective of this thing if the if the family members allow you uh, still in the workplace you are not allowed to be into that field because you will explore more and i think learning uh, is right of every person whether in any institution whether during uh, any organization so and we also see uh, if we take example of acid attack victims uh, they also fee uh, they also face criticism uh, in the workplace not because not uh, the skills are not seen that the the physical appearance is mostly seen so it is also uh, like very difficult for the women who are victims of acid violence uh, they have to face these issues uh, of uh, uh, being accepted as a privileged uh, mm -hmm. uh, social being and it's very also difficult for them to maintain uh, to maintain and be in the place of social mainstream so not only females of any uh, specific position but we see uh, females all around the world and in every sector there is some discrimination going apart and again i would like to mention that glass ceiling effect glass ceiling is there where we cannot see the things we have to realize ourselves we have to realize with experiences uh, what we have faced in our life uh, then only we can go through that effect and achieve our goals thank you glass ceiling breaking the glass ceiling yes <laughs> a very important aspect of uh, getting a kind of a leadership role in any organization maria what do you think are the biggest challenges ahead for the next generation of female leaders ji uh, so i think that the challenges that the new generation of female leaders is going to face are they are pretty similar to the ones that we are facing um so while the t while times are progressing um we we carry this this current generation of women leaders carry a lot of uh, trauma from you know constantly trying to prove ourselves that pressure is there on us constantly so we might be transmitting that collective trauma unfortunately to the next generation of women leaders who may already be struggling with an identity crisis with the pressure to adhere to certain very hard earned uh, pri pri privileges in their in their professional choices um the whole idea of choices and and a respect for those choices is also alien to most people around us um for example you know uh we have moved from a society that that you know forbid women from working outside their homes to one that encourages them or even in some cases even expects them to work but at the same time maintain very high standards of you know uh, family duties which is at times just not possible which leads these women uh, to to make certain unhealthy family choices which is also extremely traumatizing and a burden that these women leaders have to carry um and added uh, you know a uh, burden that the new uh, generation of female leaders might have to carry is one of figuring out their true choices and then also carving a path to adhere to those choices no matter what um, conservative or liberal social norms they may be surrounded by uh they'll have to create new uh balancing equations and will undoubtedly have to create transform the work culture so that they are more uh, enabling uh, to women creating balancing equations uh, yes that's a deep thought i think uh, it, it, each one of us in any position would have to think on these lines and uh, look out for the younger generation leaders especially women since we be talking of women but it applies also i think to men uh, nonetheless this is an important aspect of how we want to project ourselves to the next generation and as you rightly said tr at least trauma should not be transferred to them at least we should be able to give them something better to look forward to as they as they come into active lives and professions 
uh, women should have more, uh, I think, healthier examples to follow. And uh, there are many, I think there are many who, who can set this example for women to follow uh, in the future. <coughs> so can I ask uh, uh, Dr. Sanya, coming back to her, I think since she is the most experienced uh, compared to any one of us uh, in being in doing what she's doing, uh, if she has any final message uh, or a closing statement, so to say, uh, as a, if she can give us a call uh, to action to other women, especially as we were talking of the younger women out there, uh, what would it be, Dr. Sanya? Well, first of all, I really enjoyed listening to uh, colleagues and listening to their fascinating accounts. Uh, I think in terms of uh, a final message, I think it's very critical that we should think the role of women in the workforce of the future, uh, a workforce which is going to be transformatively shaped by technology. Uh, because uh, post-COVID, the, the work environment is really being reshaped uh, with a very complex interplay of digitization, technology, and innovation. And there, there, there are billions of people connected by uh, mobile phones and the combination of processing power, data portability and knowledge access is really transforming the workplace in so many different ways. It's making even governments agile as I explained to you when I, uh, when I was uh, speaking earlier. So uh, the role of women in the workspace of the future uh, I mean, the reshape of that has a huge potential because there are some very important dots you can join there between uh, entrepreneurship, uh, digital e-commerce, uh, and, and, uh, and, and internet penetration. So I think that the, 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 the key is to reimagine the role of women in the, in the workforce of the future. And in order to do that, uh, we must focus on uh, diversity is an endpoint. We must uh, mandate data disaggregation to ensure that we are measuring, that we are holding organizations accountable for stated policy. Uh, and then lastly, most importantly, I think that it's very important uh, for, for mindsets to change. Uh, because one of the greatest barriers women face um, in terms of working, in terms of uh, their role in the economy is the, the imbalance between personal and professional life. Uh, and, and that can only um, that, that can only be solved through a change of mindset. Uh, so, so I think that um, uh, there's a transformation that is required, but this is just the right time for that transformation. Thank you so much. Yes, mindset is the, what, what can I say? Mindset is the, the main thing that we all face, have faced and keep facing. I think we all face it at various levels in our professional lives, in our normal day-to-day -day lives, mindset. Uh, we hope that it will change. It will change uh, slowly and gradually. And uh, may I ask uh, all of you if you have a final word to say uh, 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 before we go back to London and uh, read out uh, our uh, report, which uh, Amna is preparing. Uh, so anything that occurs to you, any, any point that you want to make, most welcome. Maria, you want to say something? Yes. Yeah, uh, just one last Abdiya made about the glass ceiling. I would say women are not only facing a glass ceiling, we are actually uh, facing a concrete ceiling. We, we can't even see above. We can't even look above and see who are the women at the top because we are not being given a visibility. It's not because there are no women at the top. We have Ms. Sanya Nisha. We have all these wonderful panelists here. But unfortunately, we only get to be invited to women day panels or women entrepreneurship panels or women issue panels were never a part of the bigger narrative. And that is a big thing that's missing and we need to work for that. So uh, I think I would be happy even with the glass ceiling. We need to break <laughs> through the concrete for it. Thank you.
Yeah, building on what uh, Maria has said, I think that it's very important to uh, not only invite to to the bigger national narrative, for example, and I think that um, our colleagues, especially Dr. Nishanya and many others who are heading and part of the important positions, um, can can create a lot of a lot of differences. I think that more women, I mean, more the better or more the more women that we need at those positions but at the same time we need to also think about how we are uh, you know uh, bringing our young people like Abdiya and many others who are who are looking at us as as role models we need to pull them along to 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 the bigger narrative as well so that you know at least the conversation should not be the old conversation that already happening but the new vigor um, something innovative or something that can challenge because COVID-19 has one, given us one lesson uh, is that it's, you should not be, you will not be the same as you are say six months ago or one year ago. Um, as Dr. Sanya has also shared that it has totally shaken the government's way of approaching dealing with, with their regular government, you know, day-to-day -day basis work. For example, digitalization was something that, you know, government could not think about it, but now it's like part and parcel of the government. Daily you meet people on Zoom and even conversations are happening on that. So, you know, it's, it's like accepting the change, accepting the change, meaning accepting women at the same time. I mean, it's, it's something that can, can happen, I think. And um, these are my final thoughts. I think that these kind of conversations should continue happening. Yes, certainly, certainly. And the point you made that it should not, and Maria also made, not only of women's world, uh, it, it is very satisfying and uh, sort of gives us all an uplift to see women in positions of authority. But as you said, Maria, we, we don't even see all of them. Uh, it's, it's the concrete is in the way. Uh, and we need to come out in the open. We need to be, we need to be treated not as a female, but as a person doing something uh, which a, a man can do and maybe a woman can do better. So that, that thing has to come forth uh, and hopefully it will with time, surely with time it will come uh, forth. So I, yeah. if I can put in a word as well, I don't know yes. whether we have time or not, but I do feel, I think I'm, I'm, I'm fairly positive of it. Um, uh, the changes that have happened through technology and the way um, women are now, um, I see young ladies, my, my own two daughters I see, and uh, the way they, they now um, feel and think, and uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful from, from that standpoint when uh, one sees what's going on and uh, young women now are much more confident um, much more, I, I should think uh, they're equally capable and they've always been equally capable, but I think their, um, their voices are much better heard now because the social media doesn't, doesn't uh, um, in, in that sen sense, it doesn't discriminate. Um, there are other challenges to it, but uh, um, uh, certainly in that sense, it's fairly uh, democratic. So I'm, I'm hoping that it's uh, things are changing uh, as far as uh, gender opportunities are concerned. Um, I do feel as human beings, um, I think we, we have a very, very good opportunity to reset. That's what everybody's been saying. We need to do it right this time. Yeah. Thank you, Ayla. Hopefully we will, <laughs> we can only hope that things will only get better as time passes and the future will be better for our uh, girls and our younger uh, women who are coming out now in, I, I think in far greater numbers than we saw that before. Mm -hmm.